Hey everyone, it's that time again. Can't Draw Horses Club here on Loading Ready Run. It's Monday. Joining me today is Matt. Oh good, I picked the right direction. <laughs> I always <laughs> get my, my preview flipped. <laughs> you nailed it. Sweet. Ah. So yeah, Matt's, Matt's an artist from out east. Goes by Eiffel Art on Twitch and Twitter. And uh, he'll be showing us some stuff today. But first, I'm going to introduce our topic with a, a handy dandy presentation. <clears throat> today on Can't Draw Horses Club, we are discussing topics. Whoa, it's the 1940s, and the hot new thing is xerography, a new method of printing that uses static to attract charged toner particles to paper, and then uses heat and or pressure to fuse them to the material. Everyone loves to do it, especially people in uh, any sort of document making profession. <laughs> Fast forward. Wait a minute. Oh, that was supposed to happen earlier. <clears throat> Fast forward to the 80s. Copiers are used very heavily in the comics industry. But there's a problem. The markers that people like to scribble with uh, make the ink all smudgy. So uh, people at an art studio company made some markers out of alcohol ink that don't do that. And they named them Kopiku, derived from the word copies. Here's basically the original, it, I, the, Wikipedia said 71 colors, but I, I don't know, 72. Uh, they have their own color system. Uh, it's not all of the colors available, but there's a lot, and so they made an app so you could keep track of your uh, collection of markers, your hundreds and hundreds of markers. <laughs> I, I do not own any. Uh, so I don't know how to use them, but I think Matt does. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm gonna be just kind of following along at home. On uh, I, I've got Clip Studio, but uh, Matt has some stuff to show us. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. Oh, and, and welcome Raiders as well from Pleasant Kenobi. Ooh. Hey, everybody. Hello, Raiders. All right. I'm just going to move my stuff off of your workspace. There we go. Make myself small. There. You've, you've doodled yourself. I have, yeah. I figured I should do a little welcome doodle just to get us started. And also... Uh, Pre-stream, I get very restless if I'm not just working on something, so I decided to idly make a little me, which is somewhat redundant because there I am down in the corner, but hello, here I am again. But yeah, Copic Markers, or Copic, I guess, more accurately. Uh, that was a fascinating report because I didn't know any of that stuff. Oh, yeah, their, their only... official website has a little a little history timeline if, if you are interested. That is very, very cool. And they were always, to me, known as the uh, fancy markers <laughs> that I couldn't afford when I was younger. Uh, I feel like that's how a lot of artists definitely see them. And it's true, they're very expensive. Um, they're one of those, like, investment art supplies, like buying fancy paint or fancy brushes. They are the fancy marker. I did not um, know until, like last week that you could get ink refills for them like i thought it was just like a you buy this very expensive marker and then you throw it in the trash when it's done <laughs> yeah and thank goodness that you can get refills because boy howdy it would be quite wild to buy such an expensive marker because some of them you know you can if you're getting them individually they can go for anywhere from like 10 to 20 bucks depending on where you are availability and all that good stuff and the thought of just throwing that away when it's dry is horrifying. 
But yes, thankfully you can refill these markers and it's a very easy process. And I'm sure over the course of this stream, I'm going to be refilling quite a few because I tend to run out of ink as I'm working here. But uh, yeah, I'm just also doing a little bit of lining with some uh, deleter ink. I like to use this, I'm gonna try to tilt it not too far, but the deleter brand ink is very, very nice, very matte finish, very smooth. So it's used in a lot of uh, comics work, both here and abroad, which makes it fantastic for lining on top of marker illustrations. Nice. All right, I'm gonna put the cap back on this because I have a bad habit of gesticulating while I talk about things and I don't wanna accidentally swat. Yeah. Do you have any um, pets, cats specifically? No, that would be, <laughs> I would have to lock down several items inside the studio section of my home uh, because I have stuff just precariously. So I have two main desks for my workspace. I've got the the desk desk of computers. So all of the stuff that I'm currently looking at and also where I stream is right in front of my computer. And then I have a second larger area for all of my art supplies. And it's always a mess. It's, it's a real nightmare. And I don't know why I put it to the side and behind me because if I ever need to do like a professional Zoom call or a meeting or a meet and greet, it's bad news bears. I got to go around for several hours and tidy everything up again. But the reason I got that desk specifically was so that I could leave things out to grab at a moment's notice. Because when you're in the thick of working on something, you don't want to have to like go to a drawer, open up, get the thing, or like sort through neatly organized cabinets. Because by the time I get back, I'm like, what was I doing again? No, what was I working on? Like, I can't remember. All of my crap is just piled all over my desk all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's how it has to be. I think different people definitely have very different approaches, but that is mine. Where the the things that live on the tip of my idea tongue, <laughs> if I can use a really weird mixed metaphor, those things all go on top of my desk. Anything further back that you know I need but I don't need now, I do have like cubbies and caddies and all that kind of stuff but i tend to especially with my markers and here is a couple of those 72 color sets right here oh yeah um those stay on top of the desk at all times because i need to be able to just reach over and say i need aqua green right now and then pull it over let me fill out i'm just scribbling some circles to get my arm kind of warmed up Loose. Yes, warm-ups are important. It's going to darken me sunglasses here. So I was so excited when you asked me to come on the show. <clears throat> because as often as I yammer on much to my audience's pain or pleasure um, on my own channel about like the things I do, the things I use, which I usually talk through as I'm working on stuff uh, outside of that space, when I've done collaborations, uh, usually most people don't care too much about, you know, the tools or the process or things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, the technical side, I guess. And uh, so it's nice to have a chance to actually trot out a lot of my things. I got my inking nibs here. I've got a lot of things just out of frame uh, that aren't the normal, you know, garbage that you push out of frame when you have a camera on. Yeah. Uh, but I have plenty of art supplies here to do a bit of show and tell. Oh, please. At any given moment. Yeah. You, you, you were, you know, doing your little lines with the ink. And I was like, I want to know everything about <laughs> That nib. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was really curious somewhat recently, I think a few months back, about traditional inking. Because at, at that point, I had, I got into traditional art. I guess I should keep stepping back because not everyone knows who I am. It's very egotistical. So uh, I'm an illustrator, painter, um, now streamer, and I have been in and out of many different... Uh, art industries over the last almost 20 years, God help me, Ooh. and all digital up until about five years ago Okay, when I said I need a break 
from working digitally. All I ever do is stare at Photoshop. I look at screens all day. It's, it hurts my eyes. I want to do art hobby style. So I thought, well, I'll just pick up a couple of paints, uh, you know, pick up some cheap acrylics at Michael's and maybe just uh, mess around with those and see what traditional feels like. And then I caught the bug and I was just all about traditional art from pretty much that point forward. I still do plenty of digital stuff, especially if I'm working with um, folks in like animation and stuff, they all expect digital delivery, but pretty much all of my free time now is devoted to just painting and drawing uh, and doing all those things traditionally. And to a really fun extent, getting to explore a lot of stuff that I have no idea what it is because I haven't spent my entire art life or art career uh, professionally or casually, you know, working with these things. A lot of my peers who like, you know, go to art school or yeah. things like that, they, they know all this stuff already. They're like, yeah, we've seen a paintbrush. We know, we know what a paintbrush <laughs> does, but I'm just like, I need to look at all the different paintbrushes because I've never seen them before and I need to know how they work. So yeah, the last five years or so have been my, me obsessively trying to get my hands on every little thing, uh, no matter how big or small, gold leaf, inking. <clears throat> I'm going to try at some point, I'm sure, to get into wood carving and figuring out how to do like block prints and stuff like that. Yep. That um, is uh, one of the steps in the art journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everyone's got to move through that yeah, path. Yeah, like just a big brick of vinyl and a knife. <laughs> exactly. So it's been a big thrill, uh, especially trying to master, you know, using my hand to do all the traditional stuff. But at the same time, I have a lot of the art fundamentals um, just figured out from trial and error, mostly error over the years. And so it's really nice to kind of bring those skills into a new space and uh, make a lot more messy mistakes as I go. But because of that, because of my curiosity, I have accrued several things. Uh, <laughs> several things. So including these nibs. So a couple months back, I got really, really intrigued by uh, some YouTube channels I was watching where people were making manga traditionally mm -hmm. and watching them work, which by the way, YouTube is bonk. Like video is bonkers in general on the internet these days. Cause sometimes I catch myself thinking like I would have done anything to see these people making these things when I was a kid like I would have paid any price. I didn't have money as a kid, but I would have paid any price to be able to watch professional creators do stuff at this high level yeah. and just get to watch them for hours on end, my, like on demand for free. Like it's bananas, <laughs> the concept of that. My favorite mangaka, uh, uh, Urasawa, has just started a YouTube thing like this year and uh, it's, it's blowing my mind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the Manben show that Urasawa has done for many years and now with his new YouTube channel, like giving that kind of unfettered access to creators, legendary creators, especially like in his case, he, he goes to some of the greats because he's been in the scene so long and he knows all these people um, shaking so many hands at conventions. I'm sure that like he just has access and they just set up a camera in an artist studio for like four days, film all the raw footage and then they get to review it with them. And it's just such a thrill, especially like not just for the professional insight, cause that's obviously very cool. But for me, whenever the professional artists, especially like these real old school cats are just like, yeah, I don't know why I did that. It just looked neat. Like, yeah. like they don't have a, re they don't have a technical reason for why they did what they did. I love that stuff because Oftentimes, if someone asks me about my process, I say, well, I did it because like it, it was cool, like it looks neat and like I, I like the aesthetic of it or like I wasn't really thinking when I did this, I was listening to some beautiful music and just kind of feeling it. And to hear those kind of responses from them, it demystifies it. And I love anything that demystifies art because mm. art is just has always been just a bunch of people smacking their hands on the wall trying to figure out how to make a thing. Like it's, it's not some like mystical, you know, knowledge from the ether or whatever. It's, you just feel feelings and then you try to make pictures. And I think that's sort of the universal force that binds all of us together. And now I'm reaching behind me for a very big uh, Posca pen. 
yeah, I just saw someone in the chat. Uh, <laughs> Jillian said she'd love to see a Posca episode. And I don't even know what Posca. Like, I go to, I, I like going to art supply stores and then just looking at everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, it's so magical seeing stuff like this and being like, well, what does it do? How does it work? How is it different from what I currently have? Because I have pens already. But Poscas are wild because it's basically watered down acrylic paint. Oh. Uh, so you get a Thick. strong surface, you get thickness, you get opacity. It's beautiful. It will just cover up over anything. Oh. Even dark black. So it is like wonderful, especially if you're doing Copic stuff and you need to cover things. So I have I have a whole set of white Poscas that I use where I can very quickly co cover and correct, but also all the colors of the rainbow. So you can add stuff, effects and things like that to not only uh, illustrations like this, but my paintings as well. I'll use Poscas for finishing touches. They're great for stars or uh, even rim lighting around a subject. They can be really good for that as well. Um, it, it's a really, really nice product. Also one of those ones that's kind of pricey, uh, depending on where you are. Yeah. Uh, but I think they're definitely worth it, if, especially if you're looking for opaque pens. And I know a lot of people are, because uh, I did for many years, and I, I used to try, like, uh, what were they? Like the gel pen, like the white gel pens, and they never did it. They never worked quite. They were always at, like, 50% opacity on the slider. Uh, even if they went on strong, they would fade over time. But with the Posca, uh, it's just paint. Like there's nothing, there's nothing else to it. You like you have to shake them up because they settle, uh, and it's just really, really strong paint, which is super nice. Uh, I mean, alternatively, you could just get paint and then use like a really thin. Like I have a, I have a rigging brush here that sometimes I use uh, correcting fluid on. Okay, and I can go and correct things that way as well. But this is already in pen form, so yeah. Uh, you know, a lot easier to apply. There's like no cleanup or, you know, anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No muss, no fuss. You don't have to clean a brush afterwards, which is always very nice. Well, there are some things that this can do that Posca tips can't, um, I will say for sure, specifically to the rigging brush, um, which is called that because it used to be used in old paintings to paint the rigging on ships. Uh, um, makes, thank you for explaining that. <laughs> Yeah, it's weird. I, I was very curious about it as well. I was watching a painting tutorial video and they dropped that knowledge and I was like, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, I get it. They used to paint a lot of ships back in the day. Um, but yeah, so when you actually touch and then move, you notice the brush doesn't immediately follow after the handle. So you have like a bit of leeway time, especially like when it's actually wet and covered in paint. Um, so you get way more flow and precision, which means if your hand is shaking and yeah. like mine does quite a bit uh it doesn't automatically register every small little where is if you're using a pen it does because it's one to one it's rigid so it'll register all the shakes if you're trying to make a straight line this one is forgiving because it has to move kinetically through the handle and then the brush tip itself yeah. so yeah it's it's really good for smooth lyrical lines which is why it's used a lot in sign painting and things like that for fancy uh script yeah, I think I've, I've definitely seen people, sign makers, that do like the calligraphy or hand lettering use yeah. those brushes. Once again, some of the best videos on the internet, some of the most satisfying yes. videos are yeah. especially close-ups of people using brushes or calligraphy pens to write and draw and paint. Oh, I could watch them for a million years. Let's see what else we got here. What should we work on today? Oh, that is always the question. <laughs> it truly is. What do you got on the go there? Some geometrics? Yeah, just kind of trying to get lines out. <laughs> also really kind of, uh, isn't the first time I've used like the digital marker brush. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm I'm finding the the way that the the color layers really interesting. Oh yeah, I've always been bad at sticking to um, using anything that's not the default. Like in digital programs, I'm always such a default guy. Soft round um, all the time. Today, 
Yeah. yeah. Like even today I was working on something and uh, I was just using the hard round uh, really, really small. And that's that's been my inking brush for like 20 years. It's always my go-to mm -hmm. just because nothing gives me as clean a line. And it's gotten even better over time because every program uh, now includes stabilization within. So yeah, just like really zoomed in working in hard round. And then when I do big paintings uh, for texture, I just use the default uh, dry media, like rectangle brush, just the same brush all these years. And I feel bad about it because there are so many good brush packs out there. Like, you know, yeah. just infinite options. They all look incredible. I've seen some recently that emulate the way that gouache looks and feels. And I'm just like, I should try that. And then I just, I never do. Usually because whenever I have digital stuff open, I'm working on something under a timeline. Right. And so you stick to what you know when you're under a crunch. Because otherwise you're putting undue stress on yourself and potentially the client if you take too long. Uh, so I always just stick to what I know. And maybe that's why, again, I have such a joyful time in traditional art is because I know that I can just switch up on the fly. I can switch to a different uh, tool or whatever, and I can still have a good time and I can experiment quickly and freely. Hmm. I'm going to put some anchors on this little shirt of mine. Yeah. For me, like in addition to loving all like the traditional process and media, uh, I watch like the Adobe release or SIGGRAPH videos every year, just like what's what's the cutting edge technology that's available for like mimicking traditional art or doing like the color blending or texture or things like that. So I always yeah, I always yeah, yeah. tinker with everything. There are so many options and truly, especially in the older programs, there's just things upon things upon things that have all been grandfathered in from you know, release to release. Yeah. And it feels sometimes like you could never see it all. And sometimes you're not supposed to see it all because especially in things like Photoshop, it was built for photographers first and then illustrators uh, strong iron their way in there yeah. <laughs> and tried to, tried to make it work the best they could. Uh, and so there are so many features in that program that I will never ever see or use. There are things that I should have been using that aren't surfaced very well. Um, sometimes it feels like you're have, having to supposed to have gone to school uh, to understand how to use Photoshop. Um, and I'm very thankful for uh, my peers who have uh, graciously shared that knowledge with me over the years, especially for things just like simple things, the keyboard shortcuts and all that kind of stuff that you pick up on in the basics. Because I, like so many artists, tried to figure it all out myself um, before YouTube existed, right. which was a, a bit of a struggle. And it led to a lot of weird habits too, uh, some of which I'm still trying to break free from. Uh, a lot of weird keyboard quirks and things like that, which thankfully once I got the Cintiq uh, and the remote, I've been able to untrain my mind from going to a lot of those things, which ultimately slowed down my process. And now I'm trying to learn Clip and that's a whole different kettle of fish. It is different. Uh, it's very, very different. Uh, well, thankfully once you get all of the kind of shortcuts and windows and stuff, basically where you remember them from, from Photoshop, it's not too hard, but it works like in a fundamental way differently yeah. uh, in a way that I'm really enjoying now, especially being a traditional artist um, primarily these days. It, it, unlike Photoshop, was built with illustrators in mind. Yes. And you feel it like from the ground floor. You feel it instantly the second you start that program because it's like, do you want to draw? Do you want to paint? Like we've got tools for those things and they're not just like brushes that you select. It's an entire tool set and it's built out from that. There's widgets on top of options on top of tweaks that you can do to get it feeling legitimate, like real, um, which is just incredible. And I'm so glad, so glad that that program exists for many reasons. Um, but mostly like the brush stuff is so legitimate there have been programs in the past that were very gimmicky with the brush stuff do you remember painter Corel yeah. painter yeah i've used corel i used corel a lot way back in the day and I, it was when i think about the paint like the physical paint tools they had 
looking back now, it was so gimmicky because I don't know how many people stuck with that brush that like glops on paint thickly from start to finish in a piece. It's so bonkers to think about now because um, it basically feels like an MS Paint stamp tool at this point. Yeah. But it, they were like, they were riding on that. They were like, this is the future. And it kind of was, but also, you know, they couldn't really eat Photoshop's lunch at that time. Uh, they needed like this young upstart clip studio to come in and be like, we're going to be an industry standard for an industry that's not photography. And then we're going to pounce and get in there, especially on the Western market. Uh, and it seems to be working out. I mean, in addition to having those bonkers sales all the time, yes. I'm sure that helps significantly. Yes, very much. <laughs> and the, the lack of a subscription model and <laughs> things like that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Like, and not everyone works at a studio that will pay for their Adobe subscription, you know? For sure. It's, it's so inaccessible for so many people. And, you know, there needs to be strong competition in that space. And for so many years, Adobe was like what movie studios used. So it was like, well, how do you compete with this? <laughs> you know, if they're the industry standard, and even still, when I work jobs, you know, they'll, they'll be like, we need it in a certain format. And we need it with certain parameters and Photoshop is the one that delivers through their pipeline. Thankfully, Clip came along and they said, guess what we do? We, can <laughs> we do Photoshop, Photoshop formats. Stuff. We do large yeah. photo Photoshop format. Like we will handle any file format you need, uh, no matter what the job is. So now I can deliver from Clip and you can't tell the difference whether it was made in Photoshop or Clip, which is fantastic. Which is totally different from like loading something into GIMP and being like, aha, it's a PNG, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's truly it. Like it has that sense of legitimacy while also having accessibility. And I think that's what was sorely lacking in the sort of digital art space for so long, despite many people trying, but it's you know hard to go up against a juggernaut. Mm -hmm. All right, so you asked what we were working on, uh, and I guess, like, back to Copics, back to Copics, mm -hmm. back to very nice, bright colors. Uh, you do a lot of landscape. I do, yes. So I would like to see some, some landscapey stuff. Absolutely, yeah, I let's, like let's do a landscape. so much of your, your, the light in your work. <laughs> Light is one of my favorite things to try and capture because it can be so difficult. Mm -hmm. Comes from so many different directions. It's such a physical thing. It's such a living thing. And to capture a single image or single moment can be so tricky, especially uh, doing one of my favorite things, which is painting uh, on plain air uh, or illustrating on plain air. Really? Because uh, you have to capture the light before the light goes away. <laughs> The sun does not work on your schedule. You work on its schedule. Uh, and it can be a real heck of a thing if you're painting this big, beautiful tree with these strong, contrasty, you know, under shadows. And then the sun starts setting and all of a sudden every shadow is washed together, which is still beautiful, but it wasn't the thing you were painting at the start of the painting. Right. So you got to like adjust quickly on the fly. Uh, and I absolutely love doing things like that because I like working quickly but also it's just really nice being out in nature while you work on something, mm -hmm. which I feel like I was missing out on quite a bit when I was digital only and kind of chained to my desk. Okay, so I'm gonna open up a reference. Let's try to find something nice and bright. You mentioned some good, bright, yeah. bold colors. What sort of things do you primarily like to work on? Uh, like generally it's little throwaway things for like streaming assets. Heck yeah. Those are some of the most fun things to make. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm basically a total beginner until like a few months ago. I didn't do anything regularly. So 
I had a lot of fun um, recently, very recently, refreshing my entire layout on my stream to be summertime. So I had to redraw all the stuff that I had drawn, including my little animation here uh, to put on a summer appropriate clothing and my background as well, uh, like the giant watermelon and stuff like that. Uh, and it was really, really fun doing a, uh, a bit of an update to everything. I like, I like just making a little background. I like making it feel like something significantly different, even though it's kind of just the same stream. Um, making it feel like it's a living show, I guess, mm. is really, really fun for me. I'd like to get better at doing more of like the interactive things. I don't know how to do any of the, you know, little uh, beeps and boops and robots. There's like a lot of coding stuff involved in making super wacky and wild stream elements. I'd like to learn some of that stuff at some point, but I've never been a like a math mind kind of person. Uh, understandable. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff now that has like hooks in it so that you can just like latch onto a hook for like subscribers or followers or things like that. So right. you don't have to do as much of the work yourself. Okay, I'm going to do a nice little tree. So let's go and start sketching here. Now, what I like to do with, here's a great answer for a question that I'm sure no one asked. Um, when I'm doing Copic work, I like to use a hard pencil only. And so often in my life, including me when I was younger, I went, what is the point of these friggin' H pencils? Why does anyone use them? They feel bad to write with. Yeah. Like I try to push, I try to push my lines into the surface so that they actually show up at all. Well, let me tell you, the great thing about a hard pencil is they don't shed a lot of dust. They don't, they don't dust all over the paper. They don't smudge as much as other pencils. So when you're sketching with them, uh, especially under markers, you can sketch pretty liberally and you're not going to get any smudging of colors later on, which is pretty important oh. when, you're doing, when you're doing all kinds of sketching. So you can actually lay out stuff and you won't have to worry about any discoloration. Yeah, I guess with the, the B, with the softer leads, you would get clumping, kind of. It would mix in with your markers, like your wet. Yeah, yeah, because when the Copic goes down, it spreads medium. So there's alcohol ink inside and pigment suspended in that ink, just like with any other art supply with medium and pigment, uh, much like, you know, watered down paint or anything like that. And one of the first things it does is it diffuses that alcohol ink onto the surface and then all the little pigments go with it. And so when the surface gets wet, any dust that's left on the surface, like the mark is made in the paper, but any dust that remains on the surface goes for a ride and it gets all smudgy and it looks so bad and gross and like discolors uh, your intention, which can be quite rough if you're sticking to a plan. So my illustration is going to be very light at first. It's kind of the big downside, I guess, is when people are observing, <laughs> like on stream, uh, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't see the sketch yet. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm just like, wait, hold on. Because <laughs> once I start putting on color, it's going to get very, very dark. And you will definitely be able to see, but I just need to set myself some just gentle guides for where I want to put things in the illustration. I will say, be careful if you're working with Copics to only lay down lines you intend to keep. I'm being real swirly and twirly here because uh, it's just a study and I don't really mind. But if I was doing a finalized illustration, I would uh, keep my pencils pretty clean. So I would finish my sketch and then I go back in with my fine tune eraser here okay. and I would sort of go in and clean up because as soon as the Copic glides over the pencil, there is no erasing those pencil lines. They get sealed into the paper surface. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. And if you're trying to like erase through your marker, you probably end up with a lot of smudging too. Yeah, yeah, it just, it doesn't even budge. Like there's, it's kind of almost like a fixative. Uh, it just locks the pencils underneath and I've never found an effective way to deal with them after that point. So I always just try to, if I'm drawing like a character, I keep it pretty clean. 
Um, if I'm doing a landscape, though, for the most part, a lot of my darkest values cover the pencil anyway, so it's not a huge deal, thankfully. But if I'm ever doing something super light and bright, um, like absolute white of the paper kind of stuff, I clean those uh, marks. I will erase those. And then just some background. I sketch pretty uh, loosely because a lot of my old process, even back in the digital days, was I don't sketch to show anyone ever. Um, I only sketch to produce an illustration. And so I keep it really loose and then I do all of my lines in the inking stage. That's where, or in this case, the coloring stage. All right. And I found that that lets me keep a lot more spontaneity, a lot more looseness in my ideas. Because, you know, sometimes when you get sketching, you get so in your head or you like hyper focus on a little detail. Mm -hmm. And you're like, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look correct. And I find that by not worrying about that at this stage, by instead just blocking in the larger shapes and the larger value blocks, that I can push past that a lot quicker and get to kind of the, uh, like when you get a new sketchbook, the best thing to do is just make a mess on the first page. Just really rough it up. That is what I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you're less intimidated. Yeah. Uh, you're less worried about like what will, what will happen to this, you know, pristine, beautiful sketchbook. And it's like, it's meant to be used. So just go in there and go for it, you know? Okay, and then we're going to have some foreground foliage here that I'm not going to worry too much about right now. And I always like to go top down in terms of value. So with value, we're looking at the lightest colors first. And for those, I'm going to go with my bright, brightest greens. I'm going to pick a couple of different ones. I like to uh, vary up the colors. So I'm going to get some yellow green and some more medium green. I basically just want a combination so that it doesn't all look quite the same. So I'm gonna start with the yellow green first. I have kind of loosely sketched a cedar tree that is outside and picked a green that is way too saturated. I feel like I have to be careful not to layer stuff. Oh yeah? What do you mean? Like it feels like it distorts the color. Like I I when I'm digitally painting, I expect just like a consistent color. Oh yeah, totally. So I'm not I'm not used to thinking of layering <laughs> on the and same especially layer. with <laughs> With something like Copic, which is a very transparent, like extremely transparent medium, um, it works a lot like watercolor. So you can get some really beautiful uh, kind of looking through several different gels of light. Um, so the color theory can get intense. But also it can be very exciting with a layerable thing like this to wait till it dries and go back over it and get a subtly darker shade and then work your way down uh, transitionally through all those different shades. It gives you so much, I guess, there's no good word for it. <laughs> I always think of freedom, but it's different than that. It's, it's control. Yeah. It's like an, it's a constraint. It's like an option that you can, it gives you a play space, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I like options and I like moving very quickly between them, like at a moment's notice. I don't like to linger uh, or think too much. I 
but also that comes from a place of doing, you know, thousands of illustrations. I guess maybe there's a certain Zen reached of just like, I've done this before. I don't need to be afraid of it. So I just go in with an open heart and an open mind. Now this, this friend's going to go all the way off the page because it's a mighty tree. I'm also thinking about different um, movement directions for the strokes. So I'm doing a lot of flicks down like this, and that's because the light source is going to be above the page, shining down slightly to the back. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, I, if I make directional marks, it'll kind of feel like the sunlight is filtering down through those trees or through those leaves. And then we're just basically moving forward, also moving down. So I got to remember if this, if the light is hitting the top, then underneath is the shadows. The shadows are cool and the light is warm. So I'm using a blue or green underneath. And these shadows are gonna get so, so, so dark as they move down but I don't want to go immediately to the darkest values yet because I want to be able to control how they move from light to dark. I want to decide, you know, if it's a well-lit sunny day, that light's going to be bouncing around because light is a physical object or it's made up of a lot of very, very, very small physical objects, um, photons that are bouncing around. And when the photon hits something, it pulls some of that color along with it. And it'll like sort of, hit the ground from the sky, bring that blue color down. But if it hits the grass, it's going to grab some of that green and it's going to bounce. It's so it has like a 50-50 of blue and green in it. And that's going to bounce back up and bring light with it. So that's your sort of ambient occlusion, I think that's called. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, basically. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of like movement going on and it can be very easy to get bogged down in that kind of stuff and get very technical with it. But also, you just got to kind of feel it, you know? You feel the idea of the sunshine. It's a beautiful, bright day out there. And you know how that feels, and you know what it's like when the sun comes down. But you also know how it feels to see a sunset. Like, if the sun is setting behind this tree, you know that it's going to be so bright back here, and it's going to light around the edges. But then in here, it's going to be, like, dark with little spots of light shining through. And it's just capturing those moments in time, capturing that light as it's on its trip. Another beautiful thing about Copics, well, these ones specifically, is you can pop the cap. Any pen that can do this is a friend of mine. Oh, put it if on you the can back. Pop the cap, yeah, if you can pop the cap onto the back, especially these, because these have two tips. So if you can do that, oh, my undying love for any art supply that does that. Very important. So we're just going to keep riding down these greens, getting darker and darker here, and now working into bigger shadows. It's a bright, sunny day, so that light is creating shadows on these leaves down here, but we're still letting that light shine through, filtering down.
one of the best pieces of advice I ever got for painting objects or drawing objects is once the object looks like the thing you're trying to capture, mm -hmm. stop working on it and move on to something else because your work there is done because the audience, the viewer, usually spends a very short time looking at the thing. And if it reads at a glance, then you can spend your time making something that, you know, evokes a feeling. So if your picture contains a tree, you don't have to worry that it doesn't look like a photorealistic tree. If it has the elements of a tree, if the value is right, right. that's the most important thing, the value. The lights and darks do everything. because Humans see those first. which is wonderful in a way that I stopped uh, worrying so much because <laughs> I was such a perfectionist about like, you know, going in and drawing all the bark on a tree and like, you know, get, and there's, there's a certain pleasure that can definitely be derived from that. I know many artists who love, 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 love doing photorealism where they like, you know, tap in all the little dots on skin and like make it look real. Right. And that's incredible stuff. But just for me personally, what I really want to do my my most important thing that I ever try to do with my art, especially my landscapes, is I want to make the person who's looking at it feel like they are there. I want them to feel like I felt when I was looking at whatever I was painting. And if I can evoke that, then that's the most important thing to me. Everything else comes second, which is nice. That's it's, It was very freeing <laughs> hmm. to start feeling that way because it's... It's so easy to judge yourself, you know? For another stream, I've uh, been reading some essays by uh, John Berger, who did, uh, he's probably best known for like being the BBC host of Ways of Seeing, which is kind of his work, but he's an essayist and I guess intellectual. I, he died a number of years mm. ago, but uh, I was just reading an essay about painters being in collaboration with the whatever scene they're trying to draw whatever object of their focus and mm -hmm. or being like receptive to sort of the the likeness of what they're trying to capture rather than the precise perfect details right that's definitely it like it gets into a weird space of also, you know, what's your intent? Like, what do you want to do? Like, you know, I have my thing, but to someone else that could be a completely different aspect and they don't, they don't care so much about the one thing as they do about, you know, depicting exactly like physically what they see. But then that's another aspect of that very discussion, you know, mm -hmm. because it's their intent to present it that way, to present a photorealistic thing because we're not robots, <laughs> you know, we're not printers. Even the people that make stuff that looks absolutely real, they had an emotional want to create something like that. And they have to hope against hope that somebody else feels the same way that they do. And that's why they do it. Yeah, kind of in order for there to be like any resonance between, I guess, the, the viewer and the, the artist. <laughs> Yeah. It's always a conversation. So now I'm taking some of this dark leaf color and I'm actually using it to color in the shadows on the trunk of the tree because again, there's that bounced light moving through the leaves. I'm also gonna combine it with a bit of this green. And then I can use that to move through the bark color. 
I'm going to use some grays and some light browns and things for that. Hmm. And again, warm and cool. So cool in the shadows for this piece. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule. Things can always, you know, look different. But specifically on a bright, sunny day, uh, this is how I tend to lean. But then, so when it gets into the sunny areas where the, the trunk is lit, I'm going to switch to a warm color. And I can mix into these other ones. Are those some birds I hear? Yep. It's a very relaxing sound. It is. I, I've definitely uh, done some audio recordings just for, you know, the off season. They, I think checking the bird charts, they're here all year, but I don't know yet. I just moved here last year uh, to this location. I've been in yeah. town for a while. That's so fun. We only ever get, I live right next to a river and, uh, most of the bird sounds that I hear are birds fighting other things because it's usually the ducks trying to assert dominance over uh, raccoons, cats, uh, anything that comes even close to where they like to bathe. So it can get pretty intense. So it's nice to hear some pleasant bird song. My absolute favorite ones here are the chickadees. Oh, yeah. And they have their, you know, classic chickadee dee dee song, which is a banger, but uh, their little mating call song, um, which I forget what it's called. I think it's like Hey Sweetie or something. That's what like bird watchers call it. But it's the one that's like, bah, bah, bah. it's so calming to me. And it also always signals that like summertime is here which mm. I really, really like. So now I'm going to bring a bit of contrast to this tree by working in some greens and blues and warm colors. Just do that loosely at first. When I'm working with markers, I tend to pull them out of the case, work with them, and then throw them off to the side here so that I always remember what colors I'm working with. It's kind of like making a digital swatch when I'm working on a piece digitally, so I always know what colors I can go back to or what color families uh, are safe to go back to. Do you... It can be very um... helpful. Uh, like store the swatch colors in like the swatch thing or do you like draw a little blob for yourself i i draw a little blob i didn't know the swatch thing actually existed for a very long time i'm glad that it does but yeah i, I was always a a blobman yes matt <laughs> professional blobman yeah the noble order of blobman
Yeah, I definitely think that that layering from lighter to darker is kind of just a different order of operation or like thought technology than it's kind of what I'm used to where you you expect like colors to be like solid and distinct or you have to like manually blend them. Yes, definitely. I remember uh, the adjustment being very difficult when I first started working with traditional because I expected uh, lights to go over darks easily. Yeah. And then a friend of mine recommended oil paints because that is how you oil paint. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll try it out. And then it was very hard <laughs> and also very uh, smelly. And I was like, mm, my working space is not very big. If I had like a, a standalone studio, I would absolutely start oil painting as well. Uh, but since I was only working in an even smaller space back then, uh, I was like, I don't think I can commit to this. <laughs> it seems wild, but it is very, uh, it feels a lot like digital doing oil paints. Because you get also the the very uh, extreme reworkability, you know, being able to paint something and then just paint over it and do something else. And that is something that you definitely do not get with uh, Copics or watercolor or gouache. Mm -hmm. Those are just not available options. Well, it looks like we're about time to take a break here, so I'm just going to thank some subs. Right on. Thank you, Canoe Crasher, for 40 months support. Uh, welcome again to anyone who came in on the raids. Uh, Kinslayer6788, 47 months, thank you. And Raytex Stormcrow, 44 months, a nice even number. Uh, so... Would you like to take a bit of a break, like three, five minutes? That sounds great to me. Awesome. Okay. We'll be back shortly then, chat. Welcome back, everybody. We are on Can't Draw Horses Club. We're looking at Copex, and we have Matt with us. Hello, hello. All right. Let's get right back to it. Added in some ground. Yeah, so once I've got the subject in here, so I primarily wanted to just draw this tree, but one of the best things to do to really showcase any subject is to provide context for that thing. So I'm going to put in a background here. The number one thing that a lot of folks, uh, <laughs> I know from my Discord, a lot of folks are a little scared of making a background mm -hmm. and it can be very intimidating i mean a lot of us get into art for you know character drawing and things like that don't know too many folks who you know go to art school specifically to do backgrounds there are definitely a few and i kind of stumbled into doing backgrounds myself it was sort of a weird trajectory Okay. Well, yeah, it's just I kind of just drew whatever I wanted for the longest time. And then a few years ago, I guess it was more than a few now, uh, some dear friends of mine, Lindsay and Alex Smallbutera mm -hmm. of the Small Boo Animation Company, uh, reached out asking me if I wanted to do some backgrounds on a project for them. Uh, and they were guest directing um, Adventure Time. They were doing okay. a couple of episodes, well, one at that time, and they were doing special animation for it. 
So they needed something that didn't look like the show. They needed something that looked like weird and original. And I had, <laughs> I had done a couple of background things for like comics and illustration and was kind of just shoring up my skills for backgrounds at that time. And they were like, do you want to join? And I said, yes, absolutely. I'm not going to turn down this opportunity. It sounds really good. And I ended up having such an amazing time working on that, creating backgrounds for animation, which is very different than creating backgrounds for static images, uh, because every piece has to move and every piece has to like have purpose and flow and, you know, integrate into the scene as well. Right. And that led to working on another episode and then a few other things for Cartoon Network over the years. And yeah, so I just kind of like, I'm not going to say that I, fell or stumbled into it necessarily because I, I work and draw all the time. So it's not like I was, you know, sitting around one day and then someone saw me on the street and said, you <laughs> draw a background. <laughs> you didn't get cast for Harry Potter. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, it was just sort of a thing that I guess happened naturally. It was a natural movement, but the way our careers are with like, you know, you work on a show for an amount of time and anyone in LA who has been a storyboard artist or uh, worked on any show knows this. You work on a show for a while and then you don't work on that show anymore and you have to hustle to work on the next thing. Like you're never static. You're always moving from project to project. And sometimes that means role to role. Like sometimes you're doing something completely different um, than you were working on before. And sometimes uh, you have to like go back and study a new thing to figure out how to do this, you know, other project or whatever. And so, yeah, none of us are ever really sitting still. And I guess I just at some point moved into doing backgrounds, but that coincided very naturally dovetailed, I guess, with me starting to do uh, traditional because I wasn't doing traditional when I first got on those gigs. Um, I was all digital. And then I started doing the traditional stuff as like just a way to decompress. But then it moved into me kind of just being a landscape guy. And so naturally I'm just like fully the background guy now. It's kind of a strange thing. But I will say I've never done any traditional like animation background stuff in markers, which is something I would like to do quite a bit uh, to get back to the topic at hand, because there are a lot of animation backgrounds that are markers, especially back in the 80s and 90s. There's like watercolor backgrounds, Copic backgrounds, um, a lot of, I guess you would call it like disposable media, because, you know, a lot of these things fade over time, especially the paints they use in animation, yeah. um, as well as these markers. Like, they're not meant to hang in a gallery under lights. They will fade. It's just part of the thing. They're made for designers. Um, they're made, you know, to create an illustration and for that illustration to be copied, to your point of the, of the presentation earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I didn't, like, until I was doing research for this, I didn't realize that a lot of, like, the very poppy colors that I'd seen in print media were marker-based. Yeah, it's truly wild. And uh, I'm wondering, like, I don't actually know this for sure, but a part of me wonders if the fade is a trade-off. Like, they're able to be so bright and brilliant right. because they have that property to them but I'm not actually sure about that. It's just one of those like curiosities, strange things. Yeah. I know for sure that they have a high level of precision, which is why they're used in design. Like that's why they're used a lot in architecture and graphic design. And they were used a lot in advertisements and stuff back in the day is because it's hard to beat the tips that they provide. They're just so accurate and there's so many colors that it's kind of the one to go to. It always blows me away when I see old gouache illustrations that were used for print advertisements. Mm -hmm. Because when I paint in gouache, anyone who's seen me paint knows that I, you know, don't have a high level of precision. It's a lot of like emotion and <laughs> moving stuff around and impressionism and, you know, that, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of gouache painters I like follow on, uh, you know, social media or YouTube or whatever. 
a lot of them are design oriented. And I often forget that that is or was the like focus of those products was like for years and years of 50s, 60s, 70s, they were used in print media, you know, they were used in commercial media and stuff, signs and things. And I never really think about it like that. I always think about it just as like the medium that I use to make my goofy trees. Because if I ever had to like hand letter a sign, I think I would just fly to the moon. And I think I markers I specifically have a reputation as like a children's thing. Very true. Just get those that is washable very true. Crayolas or like get your teeny boppers some Sharpies so they can write on their arms. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Non toxic. <laughs> um, Sorry, now I'm just thinking about the Homestep cosplays. <laughs> the gray markers. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my god. Not allowed in the pool. A lot of Land hotel room bathrooms. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mad at conventions. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of my background, is, is conventions. <laughs> yeah? Rather than any sort of art. It's, it's more performance and podcast and multimedia. I miss conventions. Yeah. Yeah. Someday. Someday they'll be back. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I guess that's true. Yeah. But actually, I'm, I'm curious about... Uh, you, you mentioned markers being used in animation. For what? So there are a lot of uh, really fun backgrounds in like late 80s, early 90s anime that if you look in the backgrounds, you'll see the telltale like marker strokes. You'll see strokes next to strokes. Oh, They're used a lot in um, like exaggeration panels or like reactions. Uh, and like whenever a character shows excitement or moves really fast and it's not always, but there are select ones, especially children's programming where you'll absolutely notice that they are a Copic marker. Um, it was always either a combination of Copic marker and watercolor or, um, uh, poster color, which I have here, Ugh. this type of paint here. Um, this brand specifically is the one used by studios like Studio Ghibli. Okay. Uh, and in the a lot of their backgrounds and things, and it's sort of this really thick, um, also not uh, sun stable at all. They're not meant to be hung up for a long period of time, but everything back then was just meant to be thrown away, which is something that is bonkers now to think about, but I get it from their perspective back then of just like, we're very proud of the film we've made, but no one's going to want all of these backgrounds for random like scenes and stuff, especially when they were first starting. A lot of that stuff was either, 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 either uh, shelved or thrown away, just like thrown in the garbage. Oh, same with a lot of the cells for animation. Now, of course, later on, they would hold on to those things once they started winning awards. Yeah. They, you know, they held on to a lot of those things and you can find them for auction now for very, very high prices. But back then, it was practicality. It's actually the same thing you hear in a lot of video game companies from Japan. Uh, I'm sure, famously, a lot of people know the Final Fantasy VIII source code was just lost. They just, because they're like, who cares? We made the game already. You can buy it at the store. Yeah. Like, go buy it. But, like, they didn't think that 20 years from then, someone was like, well, what if we release it on computer systems, like on Steam? And it's they're just like, what? <laughs> what? No, we already released the game, but that's just how it is. That's just how it is now. But it wasn't like that then. Not at all. They did not. They were always looking forward. Okay, so now we've got a lot of green. So I'm going to get some blues to put in the background here. I always really loved the traditional media, um, the stuff you could tell wasn't 
just paint in old animation like that. Like there's a lot of Sailor Moon episodes that have a markery look to them. Mm. And of course, tons of comics, so many comics from then and now, like still a huge staple in that industry. And I kind of wish that I still had a foot in the comics world. So I did in like the, the mid 2010s, I was a comics guy. Um, I had a book called Power Up that came out from Boom Studios. And like I would go to a lot of cons and stuff and it was all digital. And I wish that I had been the traditional art guy at that point because I think my stuff could have looked so much more unique because not as many people were using those tools then. Right. Except like all the old heads. But even like a lot of people in the print media still, like even the people at the top had all switched over by that point. It was only the really adamant people who were like, no, <laughs> like I know markers and markers is what I know and I'm not going to switch. And it's, you know, they were seen as like, you know, fossils or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Just a uh, stubborn old man. Stubborn old man. And it's like, well, the maybe times. So. <laughs> Everyone's yeah, going to deep now. Certainly it's like a lot, it's a lot easier to work digitally and a lot more accessible which is very important. Like I wasn't able to afford to get these markers until well into uh, actually creating things, uh, you know, selling my traditional stuff. I had to get to a point where I was good enough to start selling my originals and things like that. And then I set aside a fund to be able to afford these because they're very expensive markers. Um, and I did buy cheap ones first. I'll say that, uh, you know, the really cheapo ones you can find on like Amazon and stuff. And you can tell they're very clearly knockoff markers, but they are a fraction of a fraction of the price. And they're definitely not as good, <laughs> but I am, I've always been a proponent of, you should know that you want to stick with an art supply before you invest heavily in that supply, because the hype factor is tough to fight against. And I've fallen victim to it many times of just like people are really excited about this yeah you know whatever or like about this pen this about this tool. paper the, i gotta use the g pen because everyone uses the g pen exactly you know like it is the one that like my hero uses it and it's like yeah but they know <laughs> they did like 50 issues of a comic with that and they probably went through a few other nibs before they fell on that one and like they know that they need it and so they invest in the expensive thing but if you don't have the offset for that, like if you're not selling originals or, you know, whatever, then you really got to know that you're going to want it and you're going to use it. Because I have made a lot of art supply purchases in the past that I have since regretted. Not all. And there's some stuff that I don't use all the time now, but I don't regret those things. But there's just some expensive stuff out there. And it's, you know, it's difficult and tricky to know that you want to stick with a thing. Yeah. And it can be a pain to store and it takes up space in your house, along with yeah. like any unsold prints you have. Like, yep, yep. Or books. That's very true. Heaven forbid you have to transport books. Oh my God. I know someone a couple of apartments back who lived upstairs, uh, made comics, and just all of his walls were lined with books that he was he had tried to sell for years he i guess he got like a deal with a printer and so they're like well we'll make you you know three thousand copies for a bulk price and like it was a good price but it was a big price and he's like well yeah if i i'll probably sell through like eventually and so his walls for years were just lined with unsold books and when he eventually moved he just left them behind because he's like i can't i can't afford like it would cost so much money to transport these books like, I just can't do it. And I was like, man. But that's the kind of stuff that you just never know, you know? Like, uh, yeah, well, you, you hope. People. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So as I add more values to the background here, hopefully the foreground will jump in to a more solid view 
I want a nice bright color for that sky. Something real. Yeah, that's the one. Okay. I was and again, there. I was wondering how you were going to like. Yeah. Get in around so the leaves. It's that transparency. It does absolute wonders. So you can just go right up in and over because since it's a transparent medium. And then if I need to sort of shore up those greens, I can go back in with a strong green and take care of it there. Now there's some white spots that I want to leave white because uh, they kind of give the effect of light sparkling through the tree canopy. Yeah, it's like real high specular reflection or... Yeah. Of course, I picked the marker that is on its way out, but c'est la vie. And covering up these back leaves here with the blue actually can give you a bit of a sense of depth because they get a bit of that uh, atmospheric perspective from being further back. Same with this tree back here. Uh, kind of like the, the fogginess of depth. Yeah. Yeah. So once again, those pesky uh, photons. Nah. Looking, looking through those things. Okay. And then a little bit of green shadow. Oh, I just love those bird noises. There's one that likes to sit on top of our building, just at like the edge of one of the balconies, and it just goes, pee, <laughs> and it just is like this long peep, and I, I, I don't know what it is, because <laughs> none of the other birds make that noise. It's the, the closest thing I've seen is like a video of a hummingbird sleeping. Like maybe these are really loud hummingbird snores that I'm hearing. <laughs> Oh, that would be very cute, though. It would. I just want to know if it's true. <laughs> I wonder, is there an app? Is there an app that maybe can record bird song? I use a really good app for uh, identifying things. You take a photo and then it like it knows from a database of other people who have submitted yeah, that uh, the, what, the, what the plant or app? animal is. I for, what is that app called? I think it's called iNaturalist. Okay. I and have it's very handy when I'm on like a hike and I don't know what a thing is. Merlin bird ID is what I have. Ooh. Yes, I naturalist. Apparently the last photograph I took was of chicories and endives. So there you go. Okay, so it does plants as well as... Yes. Yeah, I'm usually uh, looking to find out what uh, different plants are because there are so many around here that I don't know how to identify right and it had been a gap in my knowledge for so long and i was like when am i ever gonna like take a course on this so i someone suggested that app uh, so that i could finally find out and it's been very helpful So even when I stay in the same color family, I want to try and push the value to a different place so that you get those contrasts. And building up those contrasts is what will help the piece feel more dynamic and more real, or at least more alive. Do you tend to focus more on, like, I guess, volumes or edges? I think I used to be 
more focused on edges, but over time I've become more of a volume type of person. It's been interesting looking at kind of my art over the years, trying to figure out how things have changed and diverged because, you know, so much of it is just slow process, but I used to be a very different illustrator and I used to care about different things as well. And it's been weird seeing that shift over time because it's not like a bad thing or like, you know, it's just a difference. There's a, a thing with programming where you go back after like a year or several years and read what you wrote. And it's like, did an alien write this? <laughs> yeah, it can be rather shocking to see, you know, especially in art, like the things you focused on or thought were so important. And especially as I've tried to get better about being communicative in my art, more just like honest about what I see and feel when I'm looking at something. Uh, it's really funny to go back and look at my stuff and see what I thought people wanted, because that's like what was more important to me, especially when I first started posting art online. I don't want to shock anyone who is very young right here, but <laughs> I used to make art and sell it in the real world before I knew how to post art online. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was 2005 was when I first realized that you could put art on the internet and I was making stuff before then. But social media didn't come till many years after that even. And it kind of changed the way that the brain interacts with I guess everything <laughs> like those beautiful chemicals that get fed to us whenever someone says, Hey, I like that thing. Yeah. It can tweak you in a very strange and uh, sometimes bad way. That's why there's like that constant, constant cycle of stuff on my timeline where it's just like, why isn't the algorithm showing people this thing? And it's like, it just comes down to the thing, not getting enough likes on it. Yeah. It's bad. <laughs> It's bad, but it's also like, how do you program something that intuits the mind of the user without it being fed anything? So then it's on us to feed it, and then the cycle starts again. So it can be very, very difficult to kind of put those two ideas together without it turning into a mess. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is like garner some kind of attention which I find tough, especially lately, because all I ever want to do is make. And less everything else yeah, <laughs> involved like in, you know, running administrative running overhead. Um, exactly. Like trying to come up with like marketing pushes or branding and yes, timing out your release kind of schedule. Stuff. Yeah, you know, trying to it always bummed me out to think about a step one being how do you get people to care about the thing you're doing other than, you know, make stuff, mm -hmm. you know, that, that always seemed like enough, but now it's not. And that's not because of people. It's because of computers <laughs> and it's weird. It's strange to have to battle things like that. So I think most artists just want to, make things i mean i know that for sure because on artist twitter you're always seeing people talk about like when are we going to get off twitter and make a new thing <laughs> but then when a new thing comes along it's not you know good enough because it doesn't do what twitter does which is algorithm stuff so it's it's difficult yeah and there's also like the the established audience like there's yeah there's people who are not art twitter that are on twitter which makes twitter valuable to artists <laughs> Yes, definitely. So whenever they try to make their own little art havens, it's only artists and then it's boring. Yeah, exactly. Like you can't, you know, push your art to just artists. It has to go wider than that. And there are plenty of people outside of that sphere that love and appreciate and are moved by art. 
but it's a matter of reaching them without falling apart along the way. That is definitely a struggle for a lot of us. Okay, let's make some shadows in the grass. The chisel tip is so great for things like this. A lot of folks um, I've noticed when I whenever I talk about Copics or demonstrate Copics, they get confused about the chisel tip. They're like, I don't like the chisel tip. Why is it there? Like, I like the brush. The brush is, you know, feels like a paintbrush or whatever. But to me, the chisel tip, I would assume that for the same reasons that, uh, you know, architects or designers like it, it just gives you such a level of precision. And also something I've gotten so used to in gouache painting is using my flat brushes. It's my favorite brush to start okay. a piece and even to detail a piece because, you know, you do the big washes, of course, but then you just turn the brush on its corner and suddenly you've got a really sharp edge that you can then go in and make minute details with. I'm doing with this grass here. Yeah, I've always associated the chisel tip with calligraphy. Because it's just like the transition from wide to narrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Able to control your line that way. It's such a it's such a boon, and I didn't understand it for a long time. I was definitely team brush uh, first and foremost, but I definitely get it now. How many uh, colors so like, have you used so far in this? Ooh, that's a very good question. So I think I put a couple back, but all the ones that are currently out are, let me just lay them out for you here. So it's all these ones. So oh. probably like 15 or so. So it's definitely a wide range, um, mostly greens, <laughs> but there are some blues, purples, and warm tones in there as well. Uh, and I'm going to be shoring up some even more warm tones over the tree. So I want to get some of that sunlight feel. And in the grass back here as well, where I can layer up some yellow, get some of that sunlight shining, and then pop some green over top. Trying to make a nice lush grass. And I found the best way to do that. I used to start doing like lots of little blades of grass all over the place, but I found that if you kind of just imply that the grass is there, it does a lot of that heavy lifting. So you don't actually have to put in a lot of little details. So most veteran illustrators will tell you that the less art you have to do, the better, because it'll save you for later, both your sanity and also your hands. So a lot of them, what they get better at is economy. Like even if their style never changes, they can work twice as fast. Have you run into much hand trouble in the past? Thankfully, I haven't. Uh, I know many people who have over the years. Most of my uh, physical woes have been back problems, which I'm still 
trying to solve as time goes on. I've gotten a lot better at it. I uh, regularly do stretch breaks during my streams and things like that. I know when I need to like get up and wiggle around a little bit because I used to just ignore it entirely. I used to, you know, y'all feel like we're invincible <laughs> until we're not. And then, you know, it's a wake up call. And I definitely had that big time last year. I've had it for a few years where it's been kind of bad, but last year it kind of all came to a head and I had to really focus on it because, you know, I want to be doing this for a long time. And uh, if I don't take care of myself, I will not be able to. Bright yellowy colors. I always like bringing things up to the foreground because as you go from the background, the background is like the most desaturated, the most light uh, in a scene like this. And then the foreground, you can really, really go dark with those values, go all the way down just as dark as you'd like. Oh, interesting. And this is especially important in things like animation. If the background is moving, like on a parallax, where you'd have the background layers scrolling, uh, in opposite directions to create the feeling of moving uh, across the plane, like a panning camera shot. Right. It really helps to have super dark background elements. So it makes everything feel more realistic, even though when you're doing stuff like this, you don't actually have to add a lot of detail. It's all silhouettes. So you can just have little blobs. Right. A lot of the tension is just going to be on whatever's in the foreground on the cells that are moving. Yeah, exactly. Some really great examples of this right at the beginning of the movie, Spirited Away, when Chihiro and her family are driving in the car on their way to their new home. Just writes down, rewatch all Ghibli movies. <laughs> I take a great deal of inspiration from those works, mostly because when I first knew them in sort of the mid nineties um, to today, there was so much of an emphasis on, especially in the early times, blending new technology with old technology. Right. They were always trying to innovate. Um, I know that they got a lot of, sort of comparisons to Disney studios for that reason, because they're always like inventing new tricks and techniques and styles. And one of the things I always really liked was they're very subtle 
camera movements and all the realism that they portrayed. Yeah, I don't know. I just like cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> Big mood, honestly. <laughs> True. I mean, that's why I first got into watching them was just, I was blown away. I first saw Princess Mononoke. Yep. Uh, and it's one of the things that made me want to be an illustrator. Oh. And at that time, it was because of the animation. But now I still feel that inspiration as a background artist because it just has some of the most beautiful scenery ever there are so many just wide shots i mean the thing was supposed to feel like sort of an old samurai movie sort of an old western in that way where oh, there's so many establishing wide shots especially when ashitaka is traveling from place to place it's just japan and then a very tiny character moving very slowly across it and i absolutely adore when movies especially animated like especially animated movies these days is when animation is given time to just exist it's not pushing the thing forward there's momentum but it's not rushing it's just taking its time and being like this is the setting this is the character and lets them breathe it's rare and it's beautiful mm. Yeah, now I'm just thinking about the wind rises. Oh it's yeah, like, like nice slow or in this corner of the world. That's not a Ghibli, is it? Anyways, Princess Kaguya. There you go. Get some of the the what Takata stuff in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That was my... such a care. It was a care for like artistry. Mm hmm. My favorite Ghibli film is a Goro one, and it's uh, from up on Poppy Hill. But I love it just because of the a lot of the water stuff and just the absolute density on the interiors. Oh it's yeah, a fun. Do they man, there is some dense interior shots in those movies. I think didn't no Goro didn't do Arietti. I don't think, but uh, Arietti has some of the best interior shots because the character is so tiny. She's a little borrower. Yeah. And so everything is in such huge scale. And I don't think I've seen another Ghibli movie that is mostly interior like that. Like the scenes where they're crawling on nails and stuff to get up into the house. It's just incredible. A lot of really good subtle uh, CG in that one too. It was definitely from the era where they were trying to incorporate more CG for camera moves. Yeah, but not to the so extreme they were... that they did in like Ronya. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Things I understand that noise. Moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. I wonder. <laughs> I wonder how they're all doing. Well, Miyazaki keeps saying he'll retire. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't think a man like that ever retires. No, he cannot stop. <laughs> I've known a lot of Miyazakis in my life. They're all still working. I hope at some point that I do. I mean, I know I'm always going to be making art, but I hope that at some point I can relax on the hustle side of it when I'm older. Hmm. as I said earlier, like, you know, I don't think anyone gets into this business so that they can, you know, push a product. It's always about the art first, and then you have to do that side of it. And I would just like to do that side of it eventually. Just 
the regular arts. Yeah, I guess the people that want to get into production just kind of start there. <laughs> yeah. Or management or other complicated things <laughs> that isn't the art. I always really admired people who like are really good at managing a studio. I've known a few of those like just master administrators and they're usually also artists too but what they really want to do is just like facilitate and help other people like lift up other artists and you know make sure that they can do their work and stuff at a studio i always really like when people are good at that stuff because i'm so not that <laughs> i'm such a scatterbrain and you know i always need so much guidance mm. I always find it so incredible when people are like, I know how to make a schedule and I'm making a schedule now. I'm just oh, like, couldn't be me. Blessings. <laughs> <laughs> just any of those things with, that, you know, when it's bad, it's really bad and it makes your life bad. <laughs> yes, exactly.
<laughs> As a left-handed person, how do you feel about uh, seams on books? <laughs> They're bad. <laughs> <laughs> Takes up like the entire space where my hand goes. Yeah, it's really... I try not to complain about being left-handed because like there's so much going on in the world but sometimes it's like hey what's up with all this stuff be so much nicer if it was a little bit different also just the smudging just so much smudging <laughs> like even when that i'm part. doing um pencil stuff i've started wearing my, my art glove <laughs> just so i don't have to wash my hand as much later <laughs> Yeah, so much of the development of my kind of drawing technique has centered around just holding stuff very daintily just above the paper. But it's hard because sometimes you need to like, you know, center yourself with your palm. I tried to get in the habit of using my pinky to like sort of lift it up. Okay. Which is a very good uh, also just the pinky anchoring technique is really, really good if you're trying to get like a long flowing line because you can use it as a pivot point because your knuckle will kind of like naturally pivot. You can just also use the whole side of your hand if you're not worried about smudging, but listen, yeah, uh, it's tough out here for a left-hander. Um, but yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Ramen's in chat. Here's me spiral notebooks. Ugh. Oh, spiral notebooks. The worst. Our binders were always really hard in school. We used to have to get those really big binders with the huge rings. And I was always clunking my arm into them when I was trying to write in class. And then, like, the little desk sometimes they give you to write on doesn't have enough space for, like, the other half yeah. of the binder that has to be off the table so that your arm can be... <laughs> huh. It's very true. Yeah, from the from the angle, I didn't realize that you might be holding your hand up a little bit. I was just like, oh, he's just like putting his whole hand down there. Very brave, very <laughs> brave. Maybe that's what you can do after 10 years of experience. If I was primarily uh, working in markers, I wouldn't worry about it too much. But the amount of painting I do, it would uh, it would get bad. It would get real bad. And I've done it before. I always keep my painting palette on the left hand side because I don't want to reach over and accidentally dribble water as I come back across. That's like the main reason why I don't keep it on the right. But sometimes if I'm working, especially if I'm working on plein air, because I have a very small setup for when I work on plein air. Let me show you my... Oh, please. Yeah. You have like a little box. So I honestly just use my sketchbook. So oh. when, when I do a plein air piece and I'll be out there, I'll put my palette paper like this. I'll tape it in over top of the page on the left-hand side. So as I'm painting, if I come too far over here, I have to be careful to lift my hand up and not set it down and i have definitely done that before where i set it down and then like the page is dried so i'm going in for detail and i set it down here and so there's like a big smudge that i have to rework over there but yeah it's it can be a thing for sure oh someone's talking about top bound sketchbooks in the chat i don't know if i've seen a top bound sketchbook I wouldn't yeah. mind trying one out for sure. What kind of portrait mode sketchbooks? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, here at my desk, I've got like a big wide. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big wide thing. Uh, there we go. And I just set it vertically on my desk. Should not cover my mouth <laughs> with the <this> thing. <laughs> yeah, I just set it up vertically. So I don't have that to. is a very good thing to have. I feel like I'd like to get into more portrait style. Yeah, I guess that's the thing. If you had a portrait style, you could just turn it. For some reason, that never occurred to me. It feels like a weird taboo, but like, of course you could. You can do anything you want. It's your sketchbook. But maybe I should get a another portrait moleskin. Take that with me when I go. Mm. But sometimes it's nice also, um, I wouldn't paint in a moleskin because dang, the paper is not built for that. No. But doing marker illustrations, 
uh, you can get a lot of use out of like a couple of opposite colors. So if I took like a red, maybe a subtle red, pink, and like a green blue, because you can use them as opposite colors, uh, which means that if you layer them, they will gray out and darken, which can be very handy if you're trying to do some value stuff on the go. And it also makes a really interesting dark color, uh, more interesting than just using a dark value color, right. which is why I tend to like to mix my own dark colors when I'm painting. And then also you could use them on their own, but yeah, kind traveling, of the same way. if you're traveling with like very light, two colors would be great. Yeah, like it's the same as how you built up the tree trunk here. Yeah, exactly. Just Good like thing. slowly building up those colors on other colors. Yellow, blue, purple. This color, I feel like this marker is always going to be darker than it is, and it never, it never is. It's always just a very subtle blue, which is good. Sometimes you need the subtlety between the values, but right now I'm looking for a dark. Yeah, but it's like, if, if you think it's going to be darker, you're not going to grab it when you want a subtle one. Exactly. Just got to complain to the manufacturer. <laughs> yeah, take it back. Make it the way that I thought it was going to be. Ah, we have come up to our next break. So... All right. I'm going to thank some subs. Uh, Ricex, 79 months. Bew, 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 bew. Uh, an anonymous gifter gifted subs to Crowley's Kitten, 80 Talks, Echo Light, Oath of Rafiki, and Death of Spam. Welcome, everybody. Spicy Ferret, six months, the half year. Good work. Uh, we will be back after some commercial. See you again soon. See you soon. Welcome back, everybody, to Can't Draw Horses Club. I'm here with Matt discussing markers, specifically Copics. We're back and better than ever. <laughs> All right. What else should we do? Because I think this piece is done. So we can do another illustration for the last bit here. Hmm. Yes, that is the question. What do, what do? Is there anything you particularly hate doing, like bicycles or, uh, I don't know, feet, <laughs> noses? <laughs> uh, well, Usually when I draw a lot of those things, I draw them pretty simplified. Um, I mean, bikes, yeah, bikes are hard. Horses, of course. Yeah. Maybe a horse riding a bike. Perfect. I don't, I don't often prove to chat that I can't draw a horse, but uh, <laughs> maybe today's the day. It's finally time. friend of mine once posted on Twitter like specific breakdowns for how to draw a horse because she's very good at drawing horses and for about a day and a half I absorbed that knowledge and then promptly forgot absolutely everything there are like specific shape breakdowns and also the hardest thing about drawing horses is the spatial relationships the proportions are so difficult and they seem to shift from every single angle yep like the head size will just change <laughs> suddenly when you're rotating a horse around. They are uh, against all physics boundaries. So I'm going to Google horse and then cross my fingers and pray. I don't know. Chat really wants to see Shadow the Hedgehog. Chat always wants to see Shadow the Hedgehog. Those are those <laughs> rabble rousers from my chat trying to bring that mess over here. Uh, one of them's mine. Oh, but they're no. they're they're here for it. Either that, or you could draw a very good Totoro. <laughs> I, I could try drawing. I don't think I've ever tried drawing Totoro before. Totoro. 
Yeah, one of our yes. one of our friends, Maki, has claimed he's the best at drawing Totoro. So uh, sometimes I like really? to get other people to you know have a hand at it. Just to, you know, he can't just get away with making claims like that without <laughs> you know some competition being present. That'd be like Photoshop saying it's the best. Yeah, we can't have that because that ain't it. Totoro is a tricky creature, mostly because they they definitely have a head and a body, yeah. but they're so squished together so as to be almost indistinguishable. But it's like, it's, you know, the next door neighbor to Sonic the Hedgehog, because you always have to remember that Sonic doesn't have a neck. Right. Or, depending on the iteration, a dividing line between his eyeballs. Oh, God, I hate it when his pupils individually blink. <laughs> it's just like, what are you doing? The eyelid. There's no eyelid. No. Oh. It is very freaky. Couple of bowling pins attached to their head. Okay. Totoro's color scheme is warm, no, cool gray. Might do a mix of both types to keep things interesting. And thankfully, I've got a lot of gray.
I don't even remember if Totoro has feet. He does. The, again, much like the rest of his body, it's very amorphous. So I'm kind of going with just stubs. <laughs> but he definitely has little, um, like, claws. Okay. I'm very curious to know if the the pattern on Totoro's chest is in reference to anything particular Think type of like folklore. It's an owl. Ah, he's kind of like the prototypical owl bear kind of creature. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I think Totoro's kind of like a forest troll thing, but I think definitely there's a lot of inspiration from owls. That's so cool. Mine. I no longer wish to look at mine. <laughs> oh, wait, I didn't see it. Bring it oh, back. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right. <laughs> Behold. <laughs> Maybe I should Yay. give them legs. <laughs> I love it. There's my. didn't get better. It really is hard to beat the precision of Copics. Just getting those clean lines, but also since it is, you know, pigment in medium, you can get those sort of soft combinations as well if you apply mm -hmm. it wetly. And there is a mixing uh, that's called the zero color. It's just pure alcohol medium. And I never understood what that was for until I started working in uh, watercolor and gouache. And then I was like, oh, okay. So it's it's like water. It's like working wet into wet, um, kind of similar to how Bob Ross does it as well. Right. Where you apply the medium to the surface and then mix into it. And it allows the pigment, uh, the medium that's already there to carry the pigment together. So it makes it blend very smoothly in the middle which is a very cool. Okay, tummy time. So I'm actually gonna apply the shadow first, which I don't normally do, but it'll make it softer when I put the main color on. It's also interesting that uh, Copic now has like an airbrush that takes their, yes. their ink and uh their website has like a tutorial for just using the ink itself different mm -hmm. ways i once uh <laughs> kind of accidented myself into doing that on stream <laughs> when i was uh creating a piece because i was doing a refill and i was refilling it over what i was working oh. on and so the big a big blob of it like went on to the background and I was like, you know what? That looks kind of cool. So I just started blobbing it around and then I picked a couple of other colors and did it as well. And it made this sort of diffuse um, polka dot in the background of the picture. 
and it ended up working out really well. It's one of those happy accidents. Marker needs a refill. Now I'm going to take a warm gray. Put it over top of a cool gray. So I'm actually kind of doing the opposite of what I did in the first picture in terms of light and shadow. Yeah. So I'm using warm in the shadows and cool for the main light source color because I want this to feel warm. I want this to feel happy and safe. And so I'm making the shadows feel extra cozy. I'm also gonna add a little bit of texture to the tummy here. It was, but it was bothering me that I couldn't remember which studio had produced uh, in this corner of the world. So I was like, looking it up. It's Mappa. Uh -oh. Ah. But they did a lot of watercolory kind of stuff in it. I'll have to check that out. I don't think I've seen that one. It's beautiful and sad. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. It's somewhat about the bombing of Hiroshima so you know uh, I, even though I, I put it in the same category as the wind rises have you ever seen grave of the fireflies yep oh yeah okay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. I went on that journey once with with my mother because she was the one that you know brought Prince Mononoke into the house mm -hmm. when I was a kid. And so I was like, "You love Ghibli movies." <laughs> it's great with the Time fireflies. For a fun romp. Yeah, so she's like, "I'm never watching this again." Yeah, it's one of those movies that I deem like very important to see once, but I don't think I could ever go back. It's a very difficult watch.
This friend needs a refill. So why don't I show you how that works? Oh, please. So this is what a refill looks like. Well, more often than not, they look like this now because Copic changed the uh, system for the refills. You technically get less ink per refill now. Quite a bit less, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is 25 cubic milliliters, and this is maybe 10, 15. But uh, they cost less, so it's not, you know. Okay. It was not, like, it's not a total ripoff. It, yeah, at least they did that. Yeah. So you take off both ends. This is one of a couple of ways that you can do it. Some people use tweezers to pull out the chisel end and then just pour the stuff directly down. But I do it this way, because this is how they outlined it on the official channel, where you just put it on the chisel and then it soaks it in. They're very, very absorbent. Right. And it takes a while. I'm not going to fill it all the way back up to full, but I'm just going to recharge it enough to finish this piece. Just make some vague foliage in the background there before I ink the tote. <laughs> We're tight, I can call them that. <laughs> oh. Okay. And generally, as an indication of how full they are, you just watch the other nib, and when it starts to look saturated with ink, then that's okay. when you stop. Because there's a, res a reservoir, a reservoir in the middle of this, and once it's full up, both of the tips will be saturated. Nice. Nice and fresh. Yeah. Feels really good when you fully refill. There's nothing worse than dry markers. <laughs> Yeah, oh, so squeaky. Yeah, for those who haven't seen Totoro, I would put it in the same kind of category as Ponyo. Yes, very much. It's a magical romp with some children and nothing bad happens. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a real childlike wonder film. Mm -hmm. The kind of stuff that you feel like you're going to discover when you're a kid. Like you, yeah. it, it literally has some of the imagery that I fantasized about when I was a little kid, like crawling through a thicket of bushes and like there's a little tunnel and then you get to the other side and there's this magical world. It's got that kind of stuff, exactly. which I absolutely love. Like I grew up with the secret garden on like mm -hmm. TV and stuff. And it was just like, I want to discover a secret <laughs> hidden <laughs> like glade or something. Yeah. Did you ever watch uh, Fred Penner as a kid? Yeah. quite. A oh, yeah. Climbing through and the... And like his thing was he yeah. crawled through the log. Yeah. 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 I saw him live and he did not crawl through a log. <laughs> Onto the stage. No. That would have been quite an entrance if like some stagehands brought out a big log. <laughs> that was like it went from the middle of the stage to behind the curtain. One thing I've had to get used to uh, ever since I started streaming was I have the microphone right in front of my face. Yep. And so occasionally I'll like hunch down to look around the microphone like, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta see. It's very weird. 
Maybe someday I'll get one of those like radio host things where it hangs from above. Uh, technically with mine, I don't have to keep it in camera shot, but I've got an arm for it. Yeah. It's just, I, it's actually up in my face because I like to have a little bit of space to move my arm underneath. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, the arm is very vital. I remember uh, way back when I had just the Blue Yeti microphone and I would, it was like on the desk and I was always bumping into it or like I would hit the desk and it would rumble. It was uh, bad news bears. Yeah, the other option is to get like a uh, shotgun mic, like one of the roads oh, or something yeah. and then you, you, you mount that just a bit up and behind or it can be kind of in line with your camera, although your camera is top Above. down. How far up is it? Is it you got to? Uh, it's like two and a half feet. Okay. So yeah, and then I'd zoom in a little bit using the digital zoom. Uh, one of the big upgrades that I'm going to try to make this year is getting a mirrorless camera so that I can put it back further and get uh, optical zoom instead of digital. Okay. Because the digital zoom degrades the picture quality in a way that I'm not super in love with on no. the webcam. Working in lenses is way better. Yeah, especially like so much of this is just art focused. So I need like really good color reproduction and sharp focus. And I would also like to ideally get something that's that can do 4K. Right. Trials and tribulations of streamer gear. Yep. All right, it is inking time. Hey, Dark Cat, are you uh, explaining old boy to me? <laughs> I just see it's based on a missing person story, and I'm like, <laughs> it's kind of what happens in that movie, yeah. <laughs> Those movies, I should say, because there's now two of them, but yeah. Ah. Oh, this is exciting. One of those nice things that I saw on the uh, Munben program that made me feel like, okay, my heroes are human beings like me, uh, was several of them mentioning that they hold their breaths when they ink. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> it's not just a weird quirk of mine. But I think there is like actually a reason to do that because it it helps uh, steady your frame. If you're oh, holding your breath, true? which is kind of why uh, snipers or archers do it. Oh. And actually, if you're doing uh, filming, if you're holding a camera, holding your breath can just give your like your core and your center like a bit of stability for a, as long as you can hold it. <laughs> Yeah, you got to be careful, though. I feel like the thing with holding my breath when I ink is I don't notice I'm doing it. And then you start to like feel faint if you're doing a lot of inking. It can be intense.
It's fun to see how fast they ink on those programs as well. Mm. I'm definitely still like a beginner when it comes to traditional inking. But they're just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> With barely any sketching too. But I suppose you draw your character, you know, 40,000 times. At a certain point, you don't, <laughs> you don't need the sketch. You would just see them. Like, basically, what you're doing at that point is tracing your mind's eye. I love his little triangle claws. <laughs> yeah, little toothpicks. Reminds me of kind of um, Baloo from the Jungle Book, just like holding the fruit. Daintily. Oh, yeah. So you have three. I think it's just three in the hands as well. Hard to say. Yeah, if only there was an entire film that I could look at. But I've already got rewatch all the Ghibli films on my on my list to do. <laughs> so exactly. Oh, I guess it's not true to say rewatch because I have not seen Porco Rosso. <gasps> <laughs> That's the sound. <laughs> I went for the longest time without watching Porco Rosso. It was one of my like must do and I kept putting it off for years. And I think it was 2016. I finally watched it and it is one of the best movies ever. I mean, I know that I was watching it as a huge background nerd. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, oh, all the flying yeah. shots, the aerial shots, the clouds, the movement of the water and the beautiful vistas that they fly over. But it's also just a very heartfelt story. Yeah, I, I expect to be absolutely charmed. And yeah, I it hadn't occurred to me that it would have like the same kind of aerial space as like a uh, castle in the sky or something. Yeah, uh, so much great cloud movement and oh. As a film that started out just as like an excuse for Miyazaki to draw airplanes, which is all he has ever wanted to do in his entire life, it is actually a very, very wonderful like story. Shade these in to hide those lines there. Okay, now it's important always to save the nib out from the holder and give it a wipe down. So I don't want any dry ink. It's inevitable that eventually a couple of spots will dry on there, but I try to keep okay. all of my supplies as clean as I can. Just kind of longevity. Yeah, those things can, I mean, it takes a lot, but they can rust up, which is bad. Maintain the sharpness. A risky maneuver trying to color around stuff that I just inked because that ink will flow into the Copic if you're not careful. Okay. But I want to get some more sort of leaf detail before I call this one done. It's 
just very dainty strokes. There we go. That is a beautiful Totoro. <laughs> Thank you. It was very, very fun. It's a good suggestion. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this has been very fun. <laughs> I'm having a blast. The time has really flown by today. Good. Very, very quickly. Okay, I'm going to put all these back before I start panicking about having art supplies everywhere. <laughs> it's always, I like snap out of a trance every time I finish one of these pieces. And I go, there's markers all over my desk. Who put these here? <laughs> it's like a really boring version of Memento. <laughs> Like who left the dishes on the counter when you left leave alone? You know, it's just <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, oh, is a heart normally part of your signature? Usually, yeah. I don't know when it started being that way, but a long time ago I started putting it on all my traditional pieces and it just kind of stuck. All right. I'm just gonna thank some subs here at the end. Ah, Demon Fire gifted Eiffel Art a sub. Thank you, Demon <gasps> Fire. Thank you. And uh, Molly Lele, who was briefly in chat and might still be around. Hello, Molly. Uh, got gifted a sub by an anonymous gifter. It's <laughs> <laughs> my very small applause. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and especially thanks to Matt, who showed us a bit of, you know, a process for using Copex and did a lot of his tools and a very nice Totoro. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Uh, there is no other stream on the channel today. Uh, tomorrow we've got nine o'clock at the usual time. I'm going to be in for Talking Simulator playing Going Under, and then the Note Boys will be continuing with uh, Resident Evil Village. Uh, notes for later in the week. Uh, Adam's finished his Play It Forward of Returnal, so we are on to Kathleen playing Backbone, I believe, is the name of the game. Yes. All right. So check for that Thursday, Friday. Uh... Everything we do is supported by you, people, on our Patreon, and here at Twitch, and also the YouTubes. If you're watching this in the year 2099, uh, we had fun today. <laughs> Am I still alive? Who's the president? Uh. Oh, little last minute sub from Quest there. 43 months. Uh, what's a horse's favorite sport? Stable tennis. <coughs> Anyways, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Matt, and have a nice day, everybody. Remember to drink water and stuff. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>